Sunday, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. Thanks for, for being with us this morning. Welcome to church. Uh, glad you made it. Uh, we're really glad you made it because I know if some of you are like us, you're like, some of you parents are like, well, it's just good to be here, finally. So we're glad <laughs> we made it. Uh, for, for those of you joining us online, welcome to church. We're glad you're here. Uh, before we get going this morning, um, I, I don't want us to just uh, breeze by uh, what's happening this morning. I don't want us to breeze by these, these beautiful lyrics that we're going to sing together. Um, we, could, we could come in here and we could start real big, and, and if we do that, we may miss the power of what we're singing. So um, I believe that somebody today is in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a fight, and, um, and you need to remember that you're not alone. You're not alone in the battle. God is with you. He's fighting for you. He sees uh, what, what we can't see. He knows what we don't know. And he's telling a story that's so much bigger than our view. It's bigger than our, our view of time or space or even history. So Lord, help us. Help us today to lift our eyes up. God, uh, give us a bigger perspective of your majesty, your sovereignty, your power, your strength. God, we see a battle that you see victory. You see victory. And all I see is the battle. You see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There is nothing to fear now. Let's sing this together. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear, I lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Nothing. 
perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrows and son of suffering. Blood and tears, how can there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering, some imagine you are distant and you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embraced. And in the end, the proof is in your wounds. Yes, in the end, the proof is in your There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering, hallelujah, hallelujah. cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus,
There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Oh, hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Hallelujah to the Son. teach you guys a new song this morning. Uh, sing the chorus for you. It goes like this, and then I'm going to have you sing it with me. It goes like this. He's still the Lord Almighty. He's still the King of Kings. He's still the risen Savior reigning over everything. His name is still the highest. His strength will never fail. His word is everlasting yesterday, today, and forever. Try to sing that with me. His, he's still the Lord Almighty. Sing it. Here we go. Because he's still the Lord Almighty. He's still the King of kings. He's still the risen Savior reigning over everything. His name is still the highest. His strength will never fail. His word is everlasting yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that this morning? There's a part of this song that says, uh, oh, my soul, remember who you're singing to. And I'm just wondering this morning if there are people uh, in this, this house this morning, if there are people online that you need to, you need to do that. You need to remember this morning. Remember who you're singing to. Lift your head, lift your eyes, and look to the sun. In the test, in the trial, His grace is enough. His grace is enough. And oh, my soul, remember who you're singing to. Take heart. Hold on, remember who you're singing to. Come on. He's still the Lord Almighty. He's still the King of kings. He's still the risen Savior reigning over everything. His name is still the highest. His strength will never fail. His word is everlasting yesterday, today.
stand on. I stake my life on this Jesus, Jesus, the one I can count on, the one thing I'm sure of, Jesus, Jesus, the rock that I stand on, I stake my life on this. He's still the Lord Almighty. He's still the King of Kings. He's still the risen Savior. needs to hear that. Come on. Oh, my soul, remember who you're singing to. Take heart, hold on. Remember who you're singing to. Rumors of the sun of Today and forever. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know who he is to you this morning, but we're going to sing a lot of things that he is, and I hope that you will recognize him as this this morning in your life. You're my author, my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my
that this morning, that we serve a God that's worthy, and I don't know about you, but man, we're going through, yeah, you can have a seat if you want, if you, um, but I hope you believe that this morning, that, that as we were singing all those identities of who Christ was, that uh, that, that spoke to your, your soul uh, the way that did mine, strengthening and encouraging and, and empowering your soul. And I know you've already taken a seat, but uh, you don't have to stand back up. But just kind of look around and kind of give a smile or a handshake or a wave to those around you. Tell them, hey, you're glad to see them this, this morning, those of you that are in the house. Those of you online, once again, welcome. If there's any way we can be praying for you, if you need anything from us, be sure to leave us a comment in the comment section there. and We'll reach out to you. Once again, we want to welcome you to church, but more importantly, we want to welcome you to Jesus. So thanks for being here. Um, you have an announcement sheet that you've either been given or you will be given on your way out, and there's some things in there that you'll need to know about. So uh, if you have any questions about that, we're always available in the church office. But like I said earlier when we started the service, I don't want to breeze past just all these lyrics and all this stuff. Uh, I don't want to breeze past that. So as we welcome you here, as I'm hosting you here and welcoming you here this morning, can I just say uh, one more time, um, welcome to Jesus, because he is the same yesterday and today and forever, and his name alone is the only one worthy. And now Brian's going to come, we're going to move into our time of giving together as we continue in worship. We are going to move into our time of giving, so our ushers can come, go, or go ahead and come forward. But we're going to do something different, something special today. So also, as they're coming forward, I want to have Amanda. She's already headed up here with any of the kids that are in, that are with us. So don't go to children's time yet. You've got a job to do first. So kids and youth, come on up. We're going to do something special during our giving time. All the ways to, to give will be up on the screen, monetarily speaking. But you know, the most precious resource that any of us have, it's not so much our money. Doesn't matter how broke we are. It's not so much our money, it's our time. It's our time. So what we want to do this morning during our giving time is thank God for all those adults and all the, the older, the youth that have given up their time in our children and youth ministry over this, over this past year. And so if you are involved, we got, I don't know if you got this or not, it's, uh, we got this list, 
there are 59 names on this sheet of paper. That is all the adults and, and older youth that have volunteered to work with our kids and youth over the past year. That's everything from Wi-Fi to confirmation to high street Sunday school to, to children's church and, and, and all that stuff we do here. So if that one of you all, please stand up because our kids are going to bring something to you. So if your name's on this list, we want to thank you. So kids... Everybody is standing up. There's a lot of people on that list. There's a lot of people who, who offer their most precious resource, and that is their time. Some people on that list don't have kids in the program. Some people on that list just care about your kids and love your kids. And how important is that to a parent to know that, to know that there's some other adult out there that's, that's echoing, that's, that's supporting and affirming the stuff that you probably want to teach your kids anyway and probably do teach your kids at home. But taken from one who's raised a couple mangy boys, they don't always listen to mom and dad. But you got somebody else out there, one of those adults, that when your kids are in Sunday school or children's church or, or when they're in Wi-Fi, they're hearing the same thing that you're probably saying at home. But they're actually hearing it from another adult. They're adding value to what you're doing at home. You're shining the light of Christ into your kids, and, and that's being affirmed by what goes on here in the church. Those are special people to volunteer to do that with other people's kids. And so we're not here to glorify them, but we're here to thank God for them and thank God for their generosity, the generosity of, of their time. So as Alexa comes forward and prepares to read our scripture, let me, let me offer us a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for inviting us here into your house. We thank you for, for all the people that you've called to this special ministry of, of leading our children and our youth. These are people who, who have jobs, who've got their own kids, who, who are busy people, but Lord, they've sacrificed for the sake of your kingdom. They pour themselves out into the lives of somebody else. They share your light and your love into the life of a youth and a child in this church. And Lord, as they do that, those kids and those youth receive that light and that love. And Lord, they are prepared to share that light and love with somebody else. Lord, that's how your kingdom works, and we thank you for that. We thank you for inviting us into this place, and we ask that, that during this time you fill us in some special, some significant way with the power of your love, the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, not only may we be blessed by being here together, but may, may we then leave this place to be a blessing to somebody else in your name. Lord, it's in your precious son's name that we, that we ask these things. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Psalm, verses, Psalm 34, verses 1 through 4. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He, he freed me from all my fears. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. 
Instead, he gave his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's God on, do- on a cross. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, you know, as, as, as many of you probably already know that I've been blessed with a couple other careers prior to answering this call to pastoral ministry. For example, in a previous life, I was a U.S. Army 67 Juliet aeromedical evacuation officer. That's kind of Army speak for I was a medevac pilot, kind of like the military versions of a, a, life, a life flight pilot. And I got to tell you, I love my time in the military, and as far as I'm concerned, flying medevac and serving as a medevac instructor pilot, that was and still is, to me, the best gig in, the, in all the military. Honestly, I can't believe they paid me to do it, and, and I know Brendan probably would have struggled a bit with this, but I'd have probably done the job for free. And you know, one of the benefits of being a medevac pilot was that, was that I got to spend a lot of time at, at air shows and state fairs and county fairs and other such events. And those missions in military circles are affectionately known as dog and pony shows. Now, Army medevac's role at said dog and pony shows was really twofold. Of course, we were there to provide emergency medical evacuation services if called upon to do so. But even more than that, the thing we spent most of our time doing was just doing a little Army public relations by letting the taxpayers get up close and personal with the aircraft that they had purchased and to meet the dudes that were entrusted with the aircraft's care. And I flew a lot of these, a lot of these uh, kind of cushy missions over the years. And now the thing you need to know about, a, about an Army medevac bird is that unlike most other military aircraft, there is nothing on, nothing in, or nothing about the medevac helicopter that's classified. It's just a flying ambulance. Therefore, at air shows, Folks not only got close to the aircraft, but they could actually get in the aircraft. They could lay on the litters in the back. They could could sit in the cockpit. They could try on our flight helmets. Little kids could slobber in my mic and smudge my visor with their cotton candy sticky fingers. Short of cranking the thing up and taking off, there was really nothing off limits to the taxpaying public. Now, we may not have been the most high-tech piece of machinery on the tarmac, but because of kind of our free-for-all accessibility policy, we were generally among the most popular. Now, when doing these static display sort of meet and greets, there was always this one particular question that came up time and time again. You you could bet your paycheck on it. Peering into the cockpit, I would always be asked, how do you keep track of all those instruments and knobs and dials and gizmos and doohickeys while you're flying that thing. How do you do that? And I can't specifically remember how I would have responded to that, but whatever my response, I can guarantee you that it was far from honest. (laughs) Because like any good pilot, I no doubt let them believe that I had some superhuman ability that allowed me to monitor and manipulate all those gizmos all those dials and switches and keep track of all that stuff while simultaneously flying with my hair on fire at treetop level. Now, of course, that's not true. And since it's been, a, it's been a while since I have flown anything, I might as well come clean on this whole superhuman pilot fallacy. So here's the truth. And don't let any short on brains, long on, e- long on ego aviator tell you any, any different. Of all the instruments, knobs, knobs, switches, and dials, and gizmos in that cockpit, once you're airborne, once you're off the ground, there's only five that the pilot focuses on or really cares anything about. And those five instruments are known as the flight instruments. And I won't bore you with what they are except to say this. Of those five all-important flight instruments, there is only one that the pilot, and everybody else on board for that matter, absolutely cannot live without. That instrument, of course, is the attitude indicator. The attitude indicator. On every airplane, 
whether it's a Piper Cub, a Boeing 747, an Army helicopter, or the space shuttle, the attitude indicator is always the largest of all the instruments in the cockpit. And no matter how primitive or sophisticated the aircraft, the attitude indicator is always located dead center in front of the pilot. You see, the attitude indicator is what tells the pilot the attitude of the helicopter relative to the earth, relative to the horizon. And this makes a difference because the performance of the aircraft is dependent upon the attitude, the aircraft's attitude relative to the world around it. An uncorrected nose-high attitude will ultimately result in a stall, followed by a terrifying spin, followed by a crash. On the other hand, an uncontrolled nose-low attitude will yield a similar result. It'll just happen faster. It'll be a fiery close encounter with Mother Earth. So the only way for a pilot to manage the performance of his flying machine is to constantly manage the flying machine's attitude. To change the performance of the aircraft, the pilot has to change the attitude of the aircraft. Now, if you think about it, this little aviation ground school lesson, it has a lot of applications in our everyday life, doesn't it? Doesn't our attitude also dictate our performance in life? And wouldn't it be great if our lives were equipped with an attitude indicator of sorts right out in front of us that we could see at all times? Well, if that's true, if it's true that our attitudes dictate the performance in our lives, then, of course, the million-dollar question is, how can we go about managing our attitudes in a way that results in optimal performance? Well, back to the airplane thing for a minute. Every airplane, no matter whether it has wings or a rotor blade, every airplane has its own flight manual, has a book that tells the pilot how best to manage the attitude of that particular airframe. Well, as Christians, we too have a flight manual of sorts. It's called the Bible. It's our flight manual for life. And in the verses that we just read, the Apostle Paul gave those first century Philippian Christians an attitude indicator of sorts. He said in Philippians 2.5, that your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had, meaning that with regards to, to our attitudes, Jesus provides us with a frame of reference. He provides us with the perfect example. Now, although his standards are really, really high, those high standards, they weren't given, us, given to us as, as a way to frustrate us but rather they were given to us to point out the areas in our lives that need improvement, that need adjustment, to let us know when we're flying along with our nose too high in the air and we're about to stall, or to let us know when we're too nose low and if uncorrected, will result in our fiery death. In the verses that we read, Paul provides us with the perfect picture of the perfect human attitude the kind of attitude that God can use. Paul tells us that, that like Jesus, we're to have a, a selfless attitude, a selfless attitude. Verse 4, he says, don't think only about your own affairs, but be inst- interested in others too and what they are doing. He also says we're to have an attitude that exudes confidence, confidence that comes from knowing who we are, and confidence that comes from knowing whose we are. Check out verse 6 and 7. It says, though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. Finally, Paul says that, like Jesus, we're to have a humble, submissive attitude. Verse 8, it says, and in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on a cross. Paul says that these qualities were exhibited 
in the life of Christ through this constant management of his attitude relative to God and relative to the world around him. So using Christ as our example, we too can have that same attitude in our lives. Easy, right? Probably not so much. Because here's the thing about attitude. Attitude is one of life's intangibles. You can't touch it. When your attitude goes sour, you can't run to the store and buy a case of good attitude. It's intangible. Therefore, it's difficult to manage. Just think about it. Hardly a day passes without that word attitude entering into a conversation. And yet, that word attitude is an incredibly difficult concept to define. And yet, for the purposes of today's conversation, how about we give it a stab? How about we use this as our working definition of attitude? Here we go. Attitude is an inward feeling expressed by an outward behavior. Attitude is an inward feeling expressed by an outward behavior. Or put another way, your attitude is the thing on the inside that controls how you act and interact on the outside. It's the thing within us that determines how we see the world and therefore how we interact with the world. Let me illustrate what I mean. Take the hummingbird and the vulture, the hummingbird and the vulture. Both the hummingbird and the vulture fly over our nation's deserts. They share the same airspace, and they survive off the same desert below. Now, when the vulture looks down, what's the vulture see? The vulture sees a world full of rotting meat. Why does he see that? He sees that because that's the diet that he thrives on. Therefore, that's all the vulture looks for. But the hummingbird, looking down on that very same real estate, ignores the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, he sees only the colorful blossoms of desert plants. The vulture lives on what was. The vulture lives on the past. The vulture fills himself with what's dead and gone. But the hummingbird, hummingbird lives on, what's, on what is. The hummingbird seeks new life. The hummingbird fills himself with freshness and life. Each one of the birds finds what it's looking for. You know what? So do we. The question is, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Now, perhaps at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, a few thoughts are probably running through your mind. You're probably thinking, you know, my attitude is, is such a moving target. Some days it's good, some days it's bad. It's just got a mind of its own. Or perhaps you're wondering, you know, that all makes sense, but how do I apply it to my life? After all, it's easy to have a Christ-like attitude when everything's going great, but how do I have a Christ-like attitude when everything's going wrong in life? Well, to answer these questions, let's go to the psalm that we just read a few minutes ago, Psalm 34. Now, you'd never know it, but when David penned this psalm, his life was an utter dumpster fire. It was a train wreck. He was being chased by the mighty King Saul and his army. And you talk about a formidable enemy. You see, Saul was jealous of David, jealous to the point of turning the entire nation of Israel upside down in an effort to end his life. It hadn't always been that way. There was a time when David's music and gentle ways were a comfort to the troubled King Saul. There was a time when, when King Saul favored young David over all the others. But those times had long since passed. Driven by an attitude of jealous rage, the powerful King Saul, he now sought David's death. So here's the future King David hiding in a cave writing what's known to us as Psalm 34. Now, logically, David should have been terrified, and actually, I'm, I'm sure part of him was terrified. But nonetheless, his attitude wouldn't allow his spirit to be discouraged. You can almost hear David saying, I may be in a messed up situation right now. I may have my back against the wall, literally, 
right now. There may be a whole lot of powerful people trying to kill me, but in spite of all that, God is still good. Somehow, in the, in the midst of David's problems, he still found a way to give God some praise. Why is that? How is that? Well, perhaps when it comes to trouble, David, David had some history with God. And it was that history that, that molded his attitude. Remember, God was with David when he killed the lion and the bear. God was with David when, defying all odds, he single-handedly defeated Goliath. If God was with him during those times, then surely God was still with him even now as he was going through these troubles. Therefore, David let his attitude be driven by God instead of being driven by his current situation. And that attitude resulted in praise rather than fear, rather than panic, and rather than bitterness. So in today's text, I think, I think David gives us a few, a few pointers on how to approach our life's challenges, whether they're big challenges or, or little challenges, how to approach our life's challenges with an attitude that results in praise. First thing, it seems that David's implying that, that praise begins with the will. Praise is a matter of, of will. He says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises, all times, constantly. Not a lot of wiggle room there. So following David's attitude, that means that we are to give praise in spite of sickness. We're to give praise in spite of a bad relationship. We're to give praise in spite of being flat broke. We're to give praise even in the midst of family strife. We're to give praise in spite of having our hearts broken. We're to give praise when, like David, we're backed into a cave and we just can't see our way out of it. And yet, like David, our attitude must not be driven by our situation, but rather driven by the goodness of our God. If, that, if our attitude is, is driven by God's goodness, then praise will flow naturally. Second thing I think that David points out is that, and it's much like the first, but, but praise flows from choice. It's a choice. He says, I will boast only in the Lord. You know, it strikes me that David is praising God not only because it's the right thing to do, but he's praising God simply because he chooses to. You know, surely David knew that it was right to praise God. After all, his faith had taught him that. His faith had taught him that God was the Alpha, the Omega. God was the Creator. God's the Jehovah. You know, he's the God who provides for us. He's the God who, who fights our battles for us. So David knew that it was right to praise God just for who God was and who God is. But on top of all that, he chose to praise God simply because he felt like it. He felt like praising God because he knew what God meant to him personally. He knew God personally as his protector. He knew God personally as his sustainer. He knew God personally as his forgiver. We too should praise God simply because we feel like it. Because we personally know where God has brought us from. We personally know that God has made a way for us when there was no other way. Because we personally know that God is a friend that, that sticks with us closer than a sister or brother or a husband or a wife. Let's make it real. In fact, we ought to come to church. We ought to worship because we choose to worship, because we want to worship and not just because of some righteous sense of obligation. You see, when we freely choose to come to church, when we freely choose to just worship, we find ourselves praising freely and naturally. 
we find ourselves freely opening ourselves up to receive God's blessing and God's nourishment and God's encouragement. And most importantly, we open ourselves up to freely receive God's direction in our lives. And then look what happens next. David says, our attitude of praise, it spreads to others. It's there in verse 2 and 3. He says, I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are discouraged take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. You know, David demonstrates that the, the desired outcome, praise, it begins with an attitude that just chooses to do it. And when we lift up the name of God, we find joy and peace, a joy and peace that is contagious, a joy and peace that we can then share with, with others who have no joy and peace. When we lift up the name of God, we find hope in a world that's full of train wrecks and chaos, a hope that we can then offer to others who are in despair, a comfort that we can offer to others who are confused. Because after all, wouldn't you rather spread praise than a bad attitude? Wouldn't you rather spread praise than confusion and sadness? The world's got enough of that already. Wouldn't you rather spread praise than hatred and anger? The world's definitely got enough of that. It's all about attitude. It's that inward feeling that determines our outward actions and interactions. Now, let me close with a, with a modern-day example of a person who, who chose to approach the world with the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. An army chaplain was speaking to a wounded soldier recovering in a field hospital. Leaning over this wounded soldier's bed, chaplain empathetically said, how difficult it must be to have lost your arm in the line of duty. Grinning up at the chaplain, the wounded soldier responded, with all due respect, sir, you got it wrong. I didn't lose my arm in the line of duty. I gave my arm in the line of duty. In the same way, Jesus didn't lose his life. Living out an attitude of praise and obedience and love for his father and us, he didn't lose his life. Jesus chose to give his life. He gave his life purposefully. He gave his life willingly. Jesus gave his life on the cross in the line of duty. That is our model. That's what Paul was talking about when he wrote, your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. May it be so in our individual Christian lives and may it certainly be so in our life together as a New McHenry Church family. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for loving us in, in spite of ourselves. We thank you that you call us to righteousness, you call us to obedience. You call us to reflect your light and love into this world. But you don't just order it, Lord. You show us how to do it. You give us the example. You're a patient God. You're loving and merciful, and you, and you lead us along this path. And as imperfect as we are, Lord, if we, if we just keep our eyes focused on you, you, you bring us to the place where you want us to be. But Lord, you also ask that we are willing to pick up our cross daily and follow. So Lord, that's where we need help. We ask for your courage and your strength. We ask that you, that you give us your power, that, that we do what we can and you, and you fill in the rest as long as we're faithful. So Lord, help us to reflect a Christ-like act, attitude in all that we do, knowing that that attitude will be contagious that in this world of train wrecks and chaos and hatred and anger, Lord, we might be different. We might be a beacon of light into the darkness. So, Lord, we ask you to start right here and right now. 
Change us from the inside out so that we can perfectly reflect you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, my soul, remember who you're singing to. Oh, my soul, remember. You make it easy to love you. You are good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. You make it easy to trust you. Never left my side. You've been faithful every time. And all I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. Cause you are the refuge I run to. You are the fire. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, Jesus, you came to my rescue. upon that cross you redeemed what I had lost now my whole world revolving around you oh you're the center of my life you're the treasure you're the prize cause all
Thank you. You know, we're, we've got a lot of blessings in this church, a lot to be thankful for, but one of them is certainly our music. So, so thank you, band, for doing what you do. Thank you for your ministry. And you're probably wondering why I'm holding a coat hanger. I am now. You am now? I was wondering that, too, when Charles handed it to me. Um, there's some, we have the Million Mile Garage Sale, whatever it's called. That starts today, so to speak. Um, so today, from here, 12.30 to 5 o'clock, you can come deliver your stuff, you know, if you have stuff for the yard sale. The team will be here to receive your, to receive your, uh, your donations of your stuff. Now, the coat hanger comes in because one of the things that takes it's most time-consuming for the crew that works all this thing and sets it up is hanging up clothes. So we have a box of coat hangers out there. If you're bringing clothes um, and there's something you can hang up, take a stack, however many coat hangers you need out there. You can have this one, somebody. And take them, take them home with you and hang them up and then bring them back. That will, that will cut down a lot on the setup time that it, that it takes to put this together. Another setup thing, whether you're participating in our, in our million mile garage sale or not, um, you're actually going to get a chance to participate because something we got to do before we leave here, we got to do two things. If you're standing behind a blue chair, in that blue chair is a pocket, and in that pocket is a bunch of papers. There's, there's greeting gift cards, or not gift cards, um, welcome cards and, and offering envelopes and the like. So, lovely Vanna White and that will be by the doors, <laughs> will be by the doors, and they'll collect all the, all the papers and stuff out of there. So, if you've you got one of those blue chairs in front of you, grab the pin too. And just give them to the McEacherns, and they'll take care of those. Everybody else, and this, especially to the gentleman, not to be a chauvinist, but we got to get these chairs out of here. And Todd Rushing, and I see Thompson back there, and others that are on that crew, they're going to help kind of direct that. But we need able bodied folks to, to help get these chairs. We got to turn this into a garage in the next half hour or so, okay? So let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll get, to, get to work. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunities that lie ahead outside those doors. Help us to approach each one of those opportunities, whether they're a challenge or a blessing. Help us to do so with a Christ-like attitude so that we can worthy, be worthy of sharing your light and your love in the life of somebody else. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Go in peace, love, and serve. Amen. Amen.